Well, hello, my friend. My name is Terry Petrovic. I'm the president of Team Wow Media, uh, where I help businesses book anywhere from 40 to 500 new sales opportunities without spending any money on paid ads. I'm also the creator of Wilco Pages, uh, a Facebook community where we help people connect uh, with each other to grow each other through their businesses and through referrals. Today in this episode of uh, Small Business Weekly, we're going to hear from two two sales legends, and we're going to talk about how you can become objection proof. So stay tuned. Well, hello, my friend. Again, my name is Terry Petrovic. Uh, I am the host of Small Business Weekly, where I actually bring uh, thought leaders together to share concepts, strategies, tips, and techniques to help you grow personally and professionally. Uh, now, today we're focusing on how do you become objection proof? Today, we actually have two guests. Uh, our first guest today is Mr. Bob Berg. Bob is a co-author of the book I know you've heard about called The Go-Giver. Sold more than 1 million copies and been translated into 30 different languages. The American Management Association named Bob one of the 30 most influential leaders, and he was named one of the top 20 or top 200 most influential authors in the world. Bob is the actually the founder of the Gold Giver Success Alliance, uh, which is a wonderful mastermind community to help uh, sales professionals uh, grow their skills, but also their strategies and connect and grow. And uh, I want you, you'll see a link a little bit later to subscribe to his daily impact uh, email newsletter. Phenomenal, phenomenal education and training that Bob gives away every single day. I read those every morning and it really sets the tone of my whole day in terms of getting my head right. Uh, I love Bob because Bob's a, an advocate and a supporter uh, and a defender of free enterprise, believing that uh, the money that somebody makes is in direct proportion to how many people they're actually impacting. And he is unapologetically an animal fanatic supporting local shelters. Bob, thank you so much for being here, my friend. Thank you, Terry. Great to be with you. Always is. I'm excited. Our second guest is Mr. Jeff West. Jeff is uh, an award-winning author, uh, including the heartwarming business parable called The Unexpected Tour Guide, A Salesman, A Homeless Man, and An Incredible Adventure. He also co-authored another best-selling book called Said the Lady with the Blue Hair. I haven't read that, but it is on my list, brother. Uh, Jeff is also uh, has been a guest numerous times on any national and international shows and has been quoted in many, many publications in sales and marketing management magazine and peak sales recruiting for over 30 years. 30 years. Jeff has coached and led sales teams in multiple industries and is uh, one of the top trainers out there. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for being here, my friend. Oh, it is an honor to be here with you. Thank you so much for having us on. Well, we are here today to talk about a new book that you guys have. It's called Streetwise to Saleswise. I love it. Now, this is not your typical sales uh, book, is it, guys? Uh, I love I love the energy, the heart of this book, uh, the stories, the romance, but I also love the tactics on how I and how all of our viewers uh, can become better people uh, and better sales professionals. Uh, let's stop a second and go behind the curtain and say, how did this project come up with you guys? How did you guys get started on this project? Well, you know, uh, Bob and I have been friends for over 20 years now. And if there's time on your show, I'll tell you the story of how he and I met. It's kind of funny. But um, the, we've been friends for a long time. We communicate back and forth about different sales things a lot, too. And in the fourth quarter of 2022, uh, Bob had sent me an email, uh, wanted to get my thoughts on something. And at the end of his email, he had a little, uh, little thing that said, by the way, 
save this because this could be a really good example whenever we write our parable. And so I replied to his issue. And then I put, oh, by the way, if you're serious, oh, yes, we're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> what was your response to that, Bob? Uh, yeah, so I had I had sent that half jokingly, not not totally, uh, because years ago I had put together a, a little um, kind of uh, man, manuscript, mini manuscript, I guess, about objections, because that's been such a, a bane of the salesperson's existence, probably since sales has been a thing, and it's been a thing for a long time. And there's no reason it really had to be. So, you know, I put this together and then really didn't do anything with it. It was just one of those that didn't make the um, had to do list, if you know what I mean. And so Jeff, who was at one time a, a great sales leader um, with a, a very well-known insurance company, and that's actually uh, part of how, how we had met, um, he once he he retired from that industry after having been one of their top sales leaders, uh, managers, leaders. Uh, uh, he shifted. He made a shift over to writing, and you know all the effort he put into learning how to be a, a sales professional and a sales manager slash leader. He then put into learning how to write, and so he came out with those those two books, uh, the Unexpected Tour Guide, and then said the Lady with the Blue Hair, and they were both just absolutely fantastic. And I thought, you know, when when we were going back and forth, because he and I can talk sales for hours, <laughs> and so when when that email went back and forth, I just kind of had the thought uh, because the email I had sent him was somewhat related to it, and I just it was just sort of an afterthought, you know, that I thought, well, we could take that, you know, uh, that manuscript I kind of put together and maybe do a parable because he's such a great writer. I, I knew he could do it. So, so yeah, I think it was like half joking, but half kind of hoping he would pick up on that, you know? And he you was know, picking Josh up what you were laying down. Skinny children. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I jumped all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Jeff, let me ask you, you know, um, why do you say objections, um, really no longer need to be feared. Can you share a little bit more on that and maybe share that $23 story? Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it, one of the things that seems to be a challenge for all salespeople, is they're, especially as they're learning their career, is when the client doesn't say yes and the client gives you some <coughs> reason that they're not saying yes. And it's it tends to make a salesperson doubt their abilities. It tends to make them kind of fear going into that situation. And it's really sad because it doesn't have to be that way. There's a process, uh, a process that Bob's been using for teaching for decades, where you can comfortably walk your client through um, how to think about the objection, how to work your way through it, that we've got a, a, a step a step by step process that we use in the book to do that. But once you understand that, not only do you not have to worry about the objections, you also end up building a bond with that prospect and hopefully that they're then becoming your client. And that bond carries forward in so many ways. And it's, it's, it's a process that when it's all said and done, you're actually making a relationship that's loyal. And once you understand that and nothing works all the time, you're still going to get some, some things that where not everybody's going to say yes to you. We'll talk about that in a second, but, the truth is this process, uh, it works so well with the neurology of how the brain works that it just, it just makes for an outstanding way to, to work your way, work with your clients through the objection process. And you were saying to tell the $23 story, there was a lesson that, that I learned early on in my sales career to keep me as a salesperson from going through those highs and lows that every salesperson seems to exist. You know, you, when you make a sale, you're a winner. Everything's great. When you're not getting sales, everything's bad. Well, there was a way that I learned from the book. Uh, it's a book by Frank Betcher called How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. And in that book, one of the things that he taught, it came out, I think, in the 50s or 60s. But he taught how to calculate your average uh, earnings per sales call rather than thinking in terms of, okay, when they say yes, I'm getting paid, scratch that. Average out your average uh, 
the average earnings per sale, see how much you're making per contact. And in the uniform business that I was in at the time in Atlanta, Georgia, it was kind of a rough industry, but I knew how to get my job done. And my calls were where every company I contacted was worth $23 to me, and I knew that. And having that knowledge made me more comfortable. And one, I remember one Monday morning, I walked into a company, and it, the owner was already having a bad week. <laughs> <laughs> I had literally no lo- more than gotten my name out of my mouth and the company name about and the fact that it was a uniform company. He went off and he was talking about the evils of the uniform industry and how we were all owned by the mafia. And he didn't know me, but I couldn't be <laughs> any better. And I just started laughing. I was not laughing, but I was smiling, I guess is a better word to say. It. He stopped and he said, boy, why are you smiling at me right now? And I said, well, I just wanted to thank you for the $23. And I turned around to walk out the door. And he said, what do you mean, thank you for the $23? So I turned around and I explained to him about my average uh, company contacted was worth $23 to me. And I walked him through that a little bit. And he said, son, I need to have you come talk to my salespeople. And I said, for a fee? (laughs) Didn't didn't know I was predicting my own future. (laughs) I love it. I love it. For probably a little bit more than twenty three dollars, too. That's a fantastic it's, story. It's more than I that, love that for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely love that story, uh, Bob. I think you are one of the best I've ever heard uh, talking about objections. Um, why is it you should never try to overcome an objection? Uh, we all want to advance that sale, and as people throw in these objections out, very much like Jeff just got. Uh, you, you, you kind of want to go back and solve that problem. What's your, what's your philosophy on that? Well, you should be solving the problem, um, but you can't do it by overcoming an objection. Um, you know, when you think about what does overcoming really mean? Well, it shares a, a Latin root with the word convince. Uh, the Latin for convince was convincere. And it basically meant to conquer. So when you try to overcome an objection, you're really trying to conquer that person who gave you the objection. In other words, you're basically saying you're wrong. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but in one of Jeff's and my (laughs) many discussions on sales, we've agreed pretty much that we never met a prospect who wanted to be overcome by us. Okay, so so we would rather people just kind of reframe this now objection, the term objection, basically, it's both a philosophy and a methodology that allows the sales professional to work effectively within the objections aspect of the sales process. But rather than overcome it, what you're do what you're doing is instead you're you're first welcoming it, okay, and then you're working within the actual objection to to and partnering with your your prospective customer to get to the actual root of the objection. Okay. Once you both understand what that is, because a lot of times they don't even understand what it is at first. Once you both understand that, now you can, in partnership, work to advance the sale. You see, a lot of times when a a prospective customer or client gives you an objection, it's not the actual objection. Now, I'm not saying they're lying. Uh, Then again, I'm not saying that never happens. But if they're lying, that's a totally different thing. That's a trust issue. You've got to go way back to the beginning and and rebuild that trust. I'm I'm talking about when when there is a no like and trust feeling from the prospective customer client toward you. But here's the thing. As a sales professional, you know your product, your service. You know the entire process, the entire sales process. They don't. And depending upon what you're selling, it might be a once in a lifetime experience for that person, or it might be a, a five time and a five in a lifetime or three in a lifetime, whatever. They don't know the process like you do. So while you're very comfortable with it, they're not. And so they might have questions and concerns, but they don't want to appear ignorant or they don't know if it's appropriate to ask, or they might not even exactly know what it is they want to ask, but they sort of have that, remember the old Spider-Man cartoons, a a spidey sense? He didn't know exactly what was wrong, but something told him, 
He could sense there was something wrong, and that's how they feel, okay? And so what do they do? They don't really know the actual objection, so they blurt out that, you know, the, oh, well, your price is too high, I can't afford it, or I've got to talk to my brother-in-law, or I need to think it over, or got to, you know, and whatever. The, so, so here's the thing. A lot of times, and there's some wonderful teaching on objections out there, but back in the day, especially, it used to be the training was to overcome the objection so that if the prospect said, your price is too high, you said, blah, 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 blah. If they said, I have to think it over, you'd say, blah, 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 you know, whatever it happened to be. Well, here's the, here's the problem with that. Since they don't really know what the objection is and it, that objection could be anything, when they say the price is too high, you could give the perfect, most well-rehearsed, smooth answer to the wrong objection, right? And so that's why you don't want to try to overcome it. Your job is to work with them in partnership to discover the actual objection and then again work together to advance the sale well let me let me ask this question bob uh, and feel free to jump in jeff whenever you want when is the best time to overcome an objection well you wouldn't ever overcome the objection but the best time how do you to... answer the objection let me ask sure. that first sure the uh, um it, it, actually the best time is before it ever comes up hmm. okay and, and here's what i mean within the first week <laughs> that, that, that you're in business, okay, you will most likely hear probably within the, the first or second sales conversation you ever have, you will probably hear most of the objections that ever come up. There are certain objections that are baked into every product or service, and you're going to have the same ones every time. Okay, You know you're going to have them. So what you want to do is bring them up first and answer them. Now, people say, well, wait, why would you ever bring up something that, that, that hasn't been brought up yet first? Even if it isn't brought up during the conversation, uh, they're going to bring it up to themselves afterwards, and it's going to mess up the sale, you know, uh, post-sale, okay? But, but here's the thing. If you bring it up, it's simply education. If they bring it up, it's an objection. Which frame would you rather be working from? Mm -hmm. uh, great segue to my next question. And I'd never heard the term uh, framing. Uh, Jeff, uh, as I was reading the book, I, it just was fascinating to me. But for our viewers, can you talk about what is framing and why it's really important? Sure. You know, uh, we all see the world based on everything that's happened in our lives that bring us to the point we are right now. And it's, it's almost like we're looking out a window in our mind at the world in front of us. And that's the frame that we're going to see pretty much everything. And it's, it's as we're working in a business process, sometimes it's helpful uh, to kind of shift the perspective or change the frame of what our clients are, or our prospects are seeing. You know, that's one of the beauties of what uh, Bob's been doing with Objection Proof over the years is it takes the prospect who sees an issue, sees something that may not be exactly what they're looking for, something that might be a little bit of an impediment for you moving forward. And as you take them through the process, what you're doing in that moment is you're getting relating to them, you're going forward in such a way that, that works well. And then when you get to the point where you're ready to make the recommendation because you have earned that right with them and you've asked them questions, so you're looking for a solution together, it gives you the ability to shift that perspective just slightly. And when you do, if you've done the job before that well, their frame will shift right along with you. They'll see what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll be glad that you did that with them. That's, that's fantastic. Bob, you're nodding your head. Is there something you wanted to share, my friend? Oh, I, I loved his, you know, his, his explanation, you know, uh, you know, what is a frame when you think of it, it's the foundation from which everything else evolves, mm. right? So Jeff, like, just like Jeff said, you know, we, we see the world through our own set of eyes, our own set of beliefs. That's the frame from which we see the world. Now let's say somebody comes in and they have a frame that salespeople are pushy. Now I know that couldn't be ever correct. There's no salespeople who do that. But let's just say this person comes in with a frame that salespeople are pushy and all they want to do is try to make the sale and they don't care about, right? 
And so you're about to sit down and have a sales conversation with someone. And she says, uh, before we even start, I want to let you know, you know, I'm, I'm not some easy mark. I, I know about sales and that you just want me to buy from you or, you know, something like that. I'm exaggerating, but only slightly. And <laughs> now that her frame is one of what? Uh, adversarial. Okay. And so if we buy into that frame, just as Jeff said, right, we'd be buying into her outlook, her view. So what would we do? We'd come from that same frame. Well, no, that's not true. Rah, 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 and we're arguing now. And this is called push, right? Great influencers, great salespeople don't push. We pull, right? And so, so we need to kind of reset her frame if this is going to be a, a productive sales conversation. So it, it just might, and I'm just spitballing here, but it might, you know, sound something like, uh, you know, Jennifer, uh, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, while I've been honored to serve, you know, many people in this community through this, whatever, you know, product or service, whether this is a, a right solution for you, we can't possibly know without exploring deeper and determining whether it meets your needs. So please know our, our conversation is for both of us to discover that. And if it turns out it's a fit, great. If not, that's okay as well. So now what that. we've done is we've reframed this from, from adversarial to one of two allies who are both just out looking for her best interest. I love that. I love that. Jeff, you also introduced a, a, a new concept to me called fusion points. Mm, um, what are those and why are they so key in, I guess, uh, the sales process? You know, that's a great question, Terry. When uh, in my years in senior leadership with the insurance carrier that I was with, there was a question that always puzzled the state managers. You could, and it was that, how could you take two people who on paper look like they should be very, almost identical in skill set, identical in abilities, and you put them both out in the field of sales, and one of them ends up deciding to persist and become very successful, and the other decides to quit. And it confused me because it shouldn't have worked that way for either one's very lucrative career. And so once I began to I left the insurance industry and began to write and speak. I researched why that happens. And it led me to the studies of a, a gentleman named Dr. Antonio Damasio. And I won't get into all of that, but he's a neuroscientist uh, with USC and an adjunct professor of the Salk Institute. And basically his work showed that all decisions are made with a combination of logic and emotion. There are no exceptions to that. And so then I wonder, well, how does that affect that decision to quit? And so basically to get down to the final thing, what happens in our mind when we have an emotion in our brain, our brain sends an electrical charge into our body and we feel something. It's called a somatic marker and we feel something. Now, if it's a negative emotion in our brain, that feeling that we have makes us want to get away from whatever's going on. But if it's a positive emotion in our brain, like a sense of belonging, a sense of trust, a sense, of, a sense that this is going to be a good situation, we like the way that feels and our body responds differently. In a fusion point, the way that I, I define it is that moment in time where logic and positive emotion merge and they ignite. And what happens when they do that is it creates commitment. It creates acceleration. It creates an energy and people are comfortable moving forward. People in sales or people that are running their own small business. We all know that's a challenge for people at times that it's what can even keep them in the game and help them persist. And so in the process of building a sales model, uh, one of the things that I uh, strongly encourage people to do is to purposely incorporate fusion points along the way where you're combining that positive emotional experience with the logic of what you're trying to get done at the time. And when you do that, it literally makes the person comfortable with you. It makes them comfortable with moving forward with the logic of what you're saying. Too many times uh, sales companies uh, will spend millions and millions of dollars on a training program that for sales, that's perfectly logical. If you follow that program, you should be very successful. It's step A through Z, it works. If you get out there and work it, you'll be fine. And yet they'll still have outrageous turnover. In some industries, especially when it's commission-only sales, it'll be 90% plus in turnover in first-year people. 
And it doesn't have to be that way. The reason that it, those programs are happening like that and the turnover is still happening is because those training programs aren't, aren't addressing the emotional component in any way, shape, or form. Mm. And they're not teaching their sales team how to engage people before the, uh, in, in that context. And one of the things that we draw out in the book is even with prospecting is, in, is a way to make positive connections with a prospect before you even ask for that first meeting. So that if they've already gotten a few touches from you that, that are stimulating that positive response, and then you contact them either on the phone or face to face, whatever your methodology may be, and you contact them about setting that initial uh, visit, they are much more likely to say yes. The percentages go up pretty drastically. Can you give, can you give an example, Jeff, of what something that like that might look like? Sure. Uh, in in the book, we teach a, an idea in the prospecting of making three positive touches. Which it might be an email where you saw uh, maybe a positive <clears throat> company review, or maybe you know we I, I like to use. Uh, handwritten note cards. I learned that from Bob and I'll send, sometimes send people a handwritten note card. Uh, there are services like send out cards and others that you can even find a picture online and send it. So it takes a little research, but it's, it's, you know, a day's work to get 25 calls done probably at the most, but you can do it that way. The results that you get are so different because each time they've gotten something from you that stimulated some sort of a, a positive emotional state, then when you ask for that visit, they're going, more of them are going to say yes. I had a district manager uh, that worked for me in the Houston area in the insurance industry. Her team was opening up probably three times as new, as many new employer groups than any other team that we had. They would be opening up 150 per year where the, you know, an average district might open 50. And one of the things they were doing there, and this was before I studied it, had no idea why it was working. She and her team would go by and they would make drops, uh, different things, just little little tokens. But when they would go back, they would do that enough times that when they would go back and ask for that initial meeting, and back then we did it mostly face-to-face, they, they were getting appointments that other people couldn't touch because people mm. already liked them. They'd be walking out to the counter with something in their hand that the person had left for them. So it was pretty great. That is so smart. Uh, and it's all about being a kind human, right? And being a good person and building that relationships. Uh, Bob, let me ask you, how, how important is empathy in becoming objection-proof? Well, empathy plays such an important part. When you think about it, what, what is empathy? By dictionary definition, empathy is simply the identification with or vicarious experiencing of another person's feelings. Now, we, we can't necessarily understand a person, another person's feelings because we're not them, right? We have different life's experiences, different life's beliefs, different life's. So, so the first, the good news is that communicating, effectively communicating empathy does not mean that you have to understand exactly how they feel. Because again, you might have no idea how they feel. What it does mean is that you communicate, and this is, it could be by what you say or how you say it or simply how you show up. You're communicating that, that you understand their feeling something. And that this something is distressful to them and that you are there to help them work through it. Okay. So, you know, as the realtor uh, who's just shown someone a home that they've, they've, uh, that they apparently love, but then they say, well, I don't know, you know, I think the house is too far from, from town. Now, if you're going to try to overcome that, right, you're going to say, well, actually it's only 10 miles away, not really far at all. Well, we, we want to be close to everything. It's not a problem. It's 25 minute ride on a bad day without traffic. You can make it in 15, right? It, now you're, again, it's the push you're trying to overcome. But if you have empathy, um, you know, the person says too far from town, you might say, could be, uh, tell me more. What are you thinking? Right. And now they, they tell, well, we really like to be close to where everything is. And that tells you a little, but it doesn't tell you what you need, but you're going to be empathetic and you're going to say, sounds like that's very important to you, which of course it is. She's just told you how important it is. Sounds like that's very important to you. If I may ask, when you say close to where everything is, are there some specifics you're thinking of? Well, yeah, you know, with our, our little girl and probably a couple more 
along the way. We want to make sure we're close to the, uh, you know, to, to, to food and to uh, entertainment and, and heaven forbid one of the kids gets hurt and we got to get them to the hospital. Here's the thing, you know, my spouse and I, uh, we both grew up in the city where everything's so close to us. 10 miles might as well be a lifetime away. Boom. Okay. So because we were empathetic, she felt very safe in telling us exactly what was, right? There was nothing, the, the, the defensiveness was dropped. She knew she was safe. It was okay, we, we have empathy. We're, we're concerned about her. And again, this has to be genuine and authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and so now we can say, hmm, you know, I, that makes a lot of sense. So if I'm understanding you correctly, um, what you're saying is as, as much as you like the idea of living in this home, we need to, um, you know, also make sure that's in alignment with yours and, and uh, you know, uh, Dave's feelings about the distance. And she says, yeah, well, that's exactly it. That, that's exactly it. Well, okay, now we we're in a position to be able to come up with a possible solution. We know it's not how far from town she is that they need to be. They need to be close to the amenities. That's what the real issue is. So remember, by the way, if we try to overcome the objection of close to town, what are we doing? Well, we're right doing, we're, we're no further ahead than we were. But if we have empathy, we're able to help draw out the true the situation. So now we can, you know, let her know that two miles from here, there's a new, um, uh, you know, neighborhood going up a new development and, and they're going to have a number of restaurants and entertainment and movies. They're going to have a ball field and there's going to be a small emergency walk-in clinic. Now, I don't know if that will meet your needs or not. This is what we call the out or back door. We're letting them know, right? Don't know if this will meet your needs or not. Um, but would you like to take a look and see if we're in the ballpark? Well, the level of trust now through that empathy has now grown, you know, tenfold. I love it. I love it. Jeff, as, as we wrap this up, um, I want to uh, talk about the five steps uh, with objections and how to handle that like a pro. Um, would you share, please? Sure. You know, what Bob did is just such a great example of that. And you notice, too, by what he just demonstrated, the buyer or the potential buyer is going to have so many emotional positive responses to how he handled that, that when he makes the logical recommendation, there's a bond there that's already been helping them move forward. But basically the steps are first off, control your own emotions. You know, as salespeople, if we get an objection at times, it can almost make us feel a little bit of that negative emotional somatic marker response in ourselves. So it starts with controlling your own emotions because that prospect is going to probably feed off of your emotions and give you some of the same back. Uh, step two is to do what Bob just did. Empathize with their concern. Let them know that it's valid and you understand that. I always say stop short of specifically agreeing, but make sure that you uh, they understand you and they know you're digging in there and you're trying to help understand their point of view. Uh, third, I always say dig a little deeper because, because like Bob says, that initial objection sometimes it's just a symptom of what's really going on underneath. Then isolate the issue. I, I, I like to see people uh, ask the question, once you've understood that, is there any other thing, uh, if we got that address, is there any other thing that would be an impediment to us moving forward? Anything that would keep you from being comfortable for that? And then the final thing is to provide the solutions. Make your recommendations, show social proof, and close the sale. But that whole process is so geared toward your personal empathy level, uh, controlling your emotions, understand, get, making sure that you really understand their concern and get, get in there with them, uh, solve the issue with them instead of trying to overcome them. And then when you make your recommendations, they're going to feel positive toward you and the likelihood of them moving forward, the percentage chance raises drastically. I love it. I love it. Gentlemen, I want to say thanks so much for uh, being here today and sharing your valuable time and your insights on how we could be better salespeople and better people overall. Any closing thoughts that either one of you would like to share? You know, I, Terry, I think it's like anything else. And, you know, and I remember what an old mentor of mine once said, if you want to make a lot of money in sales, he said, don't have making money as your target. The target is serving others. 
When you hit the target, you'll get a reward. That reward will come in the form of money. And you can do with that money whatever you choose. But never forget the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It isn't the target itself. Your target is serving others. And I think when we when we keep that at the forefront of our consciousness, now we're really nine steps ahead of the game mm-hmm. in a 10 step game. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you again, uh, Jeff and Bob for being here. My friend, I hope you got some value out of today's session. If you love sales, and you want to up your game, I highly encourage you to uh, go to the website jeffcwest.com uh, and order the book. You can get on Amazon, you can get on Kindle, and pretty much any way you want to do that. Uh, this is one of the best parables I've ever read in terms of um, having the tactical skills that uh, I can use immediately to grow my business. If you got value out of today's conversation, by all means, uh, share this video. If you have questions, please leave your comments and thoughts down below this video. We'll respond to each and every one of them. Uh, My name is Terry Petrovic. Remember this, my friend. You have a choice. Make it a better than terrific day and a prosperous one because you, yes, you absolutely deserve it. Until next time, bye-bye for now.